Hey, coaches, welcome to Championship Culture. Got a special guest today. We're, we're breaking new ground, but you're going to find out I kind of cheated when I'm breaking this new ground. We've got David Walker with us, who uh, he, he's got an exciting new podcast that he's the co-host of, but he is our first basketball coach that we've had on Championship Culture. And we said uh, when I started this thing that we were going to we were going to get coaches from all different sports, but you're going to find out I kind of cheated because David, although he's a college, he was a college basketball coach. He also played offensive line at Oklahoma for more, uh, for Coach Stoop. So I kind of cheated. He's going to bring a lot of football with his basketball. But uh, excited to have you on here, man. We did we did a little bit of talking before we started recruiting. Uh, I, I've listened to uh, two of your podcasts, and it's an uh, exciting thing you got going there. So when we get to that question five, I really want you to uh, really just unload and, and, and really explain to everybody so we can get everyone watching the podcast. But let's start out. I, I always think this is the hardest question is can you give a one-minute elevator introduction of yourself? Oh, I will try. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, I have kind of a unique background. So uh, I was a fourth-generation coach. So uh, great-grandpa, grandpa, dad, a couple of them are in the Oklahoma Coaches Hall of Fame. So we're all basketball coaches. I grew up a gym rat, but uh, kind of age 14, kind of got that 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, I'm not going to get any taller. So my dad had the foresight to get me in the weight room realized my college potential was going to be, you know, playing offense or defensive line. So ended up going to Oklahoma, playing for Coach Stoops, uh, was a part of a Rose Bowl championship team, uh, played the national championship against LSU in the Sugar Bowl uh, with the Heisman Trophy winner and Jason White, and uh, ended up being able to finish my college career at Harding University, with, uh, playing alongside my two younger brothers. So I had a, a neat um, kind of victory lap there to finish out at Harding. I met my wife there at Harding as well, so a really special place to us. And then Getting into coaching, I, I went into uh, the, a GA route and video coordinator route at the University of Arkansas with their uh, women's basketball team, and then did that for two seasons. The assistant job at Harding came open, which was a chance to, for me to be the only assistant in the D2 level, which gives you a lot of uh, responsibilities. There was a lot of growth opportunity there, so we went back to Harding, did that for five years, and uh, was able to be a part of some exciting things there. So, uh, so I, I jokingly told you, I, I think you're the, the dream basketball coach for most football guys, you know, that you could have a basketball coach that, that, uh, that played uh, for, uh, you know, won a national championship at Oklahoma in football. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's exciting. All right. Uh, the second question is, you know, how, what is your definition of culture? You know, it's kind of a buzzword right now, but how do you break it down when you're talking to kids? Well, I think culture, everybody has their identity of that, right? So if you don't have an identity as, as a coach or a program, you, you need to find one yesterday. Uh, but I think from a culture standpoint, for me, I think there's a lot of approaches to that. Everybody's got their own. Everybody has what works for them. My personal perspective on it is, I think if you, you can talk all you want about culture, about goals, about all those things, and if your kids don't feel valued, then none of it's going to go off like you want it to. So I think at the very core of everything that I believe in from a program building standpoint, I don't care if it's youth sports or if it's college or high school, whatever that is, that if your kids don't feel valued day to day, not in, in their, they're lingering on this, did I perform well enough for coach to be cool with me whenever practice is over, when the game is over, if they're always in that insecure place where they don't know that you value them at their core as a person, then you're not going to get the results that you could get from them. On the contrary, if they feel valued, they're going to do everything within their power to please you, succeed for you, win with you, win for you, go through a wall for you. They're going to do all those things. But at the very core of all that, I think, is they have to feel valued from you as a coach. That's awesome, man. That's a, a great way of putting it. All right. Uh, question three is when it starts getting kind of into the, to the nuts and the bolts. Yep. What are the three best things you do to build culture in your program? Uh, well, I've, I've got a couple of that I wrote down here. And I think one, you know, you mentioned my background coming from Oklahoma, playing for Coach Stoops. You know, when we got out there, there was legendary strength and conditioning coach Jerry Schmidt, who's now at Texas A&M. And I think a lot of the Sooners were relieved when he <laughs> went down there. Uh, but he's great at what he does. But one of the biggest things that he does is it's everything is accountability. So every single thing you do, there is a time. There's, you, you have something you have to make. There's always some consequence for doing or not doing your job. And so I think, you know, for me, when I got to, to Harding University, when I arrived there as assistant coach, uh, Coach Tim Kirby had a good program. They were winning, but we hadn't quite ever made it to 
an NCAA tournament or won a conference championship or any of those things. And so we're trying to figure out how we take that next step. And one of the things that we were instituting was just more accountability of there's times, there's consequences and all those things. And not, not to be overly like, you know, penalizing, but just to say like, hey, there are consequences and repercussions for you know, not making your time. And it might not show up on the track, but it might show up in the fourth quarter. And so I think those, being able to drill down on accountability, I think is huge. And that was one of the things I really took from Coach Stoops was, like, there, is, it, there is no gray area. It's you made your time or you didn't make your time. And you, or you did all 10 reps, or we saw you only, with, you only did eight and you tried to rack the weight. And strength coach is sitting there, you know, calling you out for it. So I think all those things matter. And that's just, a, that's goes to the difference of those kind of kids that they realize, hey, I can cut the line this time on this gasser, or I better touch the line because if I don't, I'm going to be held accountable, not just by my coaching staff, but ultimately you start getting held accountable by your teammates once you institute that, which that as a coach, that's what we all want, right? Is we want those teammates holding each other accountable also. So it doesn't always have to come from the coach. So I think accountability was one. I think, Two is relatability. Uh, I think as a coach, sometimes, I think we've all had different kinds of coaches. Uh, some of the things I've learned the most are from the coaches I felt like I didn't have a great experience with. And some of the ones I felt like I had the, the worst experience with were the ones I didn't feel were relatable to us. Like they didn't really give of themselves to us other than showing up for practice or demanding certain things from a game. I think for what we tried to do as a coaching staff was be relatable to our kids. And the way I personally tried to do that was we want our kids to know us. We want our players to, to feel like that, that, you know, we're real people with families that, that invest in them, that care about them. And we're, we're not just, you know, blowing the whistle and showing up at practice or driving the bus or doing all those things that, that coaches do, but that we are, you know, invested in them and we want them to be invested with us. So for, from us, uh, from my perspective on that, we had for four years at Harding, we had a Wednesday night Bible study that we had for men's and women's basketball players kind of evolved into some of their, their girlfriends or boyfriends, and then they had some students would come. And so you know, on a given night, we might have 40 to 50 kids at our house on a Wednesday building community that they can, our players, we might just finish practice and an hour and a half later, they're at the house having snacks, hanging out, you know, with holding my son, you know, you know, all those different things that, that to me is where you start to get, your players recognize that there's some relatability here, that there's not just a, this is not just coach. Coach has a life. Coach has life outside of this. And when you start to realize, I think for players, when they start to put those pieces together, I think there, there's always going to be people that have an issue with, can I play more? I think I should play more, this, that, or the other. But I think when they really understand, like, coach is a real person. He has a family. He has a job. He wants to win. He wants to put the best product out there. I think that's where you start to have a better culture once you're relatable and they understand that that you care about them, that you have more going on than just the game. So I think letting them in, letting them know you is important. Um, the third one is uh, vision casting. So, you know, some of your listeners maybe have walked into a program, you know, like I did as a true freshman in Norman, where we were two years removed from a national championship. You know, they had just beat Florida State in the Orange Bowl, and we're, we got guys walking around with these championship rings on their finger, and, and all the, they've had all this experience. So, for me, I was fortunate to be able to walk into a program that had already done some things to hang their hat on. And some, some of your coaching, your coaches that listen, they might be taking over a program or are at a program now where there's a long legacy of championships and things like that. And then there's other coaches who are trying to figure out, how do I build that? Where do we start from? And sometimes I think it's really hard. It, you know, if you look at players and you ask them, hey, who won the national championship last year? Or who won the state championship last year? And you, if you pulled your team in August, there's probably, you know, on most teams, there's going to be some kids that can't raise their hand and answer that question, you know? And I think that's, that to me is what we try to, to nip that stuff in the bud, like the ignorance of what's going on around you is how can you pursue things if you're not really aware of who's doing it, how they're doing it, how do you ever get from here to there without that knowledge? Um, so I think about, you know, um, as a side note, so when my dad, who's a high school coach in Oklahoma, went to... Um, eight championship games in 10 years and the first championship that they made a lot of the, the players on the team that he, he asked him like how many of you guys have ever been to a state championship game and only half of them raised their hand and he said well because of you guys every kid in Fort Gibson Oklahoma that's here in Oklahoma City that they watch you play when they're one of those days when they're in high school when they are asked that question every single hand will be raised because you set that tone so it, it was just amazing you think how do you get to a level when kids don't even know what they're playing for so what we did, I had the, our players over to the house to watch the national championship game on CBS 
uh, Division II National Championship game. It was, I believe it was West Texas and uh, a school out of Ohio. Uh, but they were, they're playing as Ashland, Ashland and West Texas. They're, they're playing the National Championship game. We had the kids come over to watch that to see like, hey, we, at that, I think at that time we were coming off a season, we were like 19 and nine. We were pretty good, had everybody coming back. Thought we'd be pretty good the next year. And it was like, look, like this is how close we are. We're not far off of these teams. And then, you know, the next season, what we started implementing was we had a championship belt, but I, a $20 Ric Flair style old WCW championship belt that I had, I bought for 20 bucks at Walmart, a toy version. Um, and I had that belt that we would use for preseason conditioning. So if we were flipping tires, if we were doing a, four, a mile timed run, whatever, whatever we were doing, if we were going to have a winner on Friday mornings during preseason. So we're going to some kind of obstacle course, some type of competition. And whoever won that competition got to have the championship belt, take a picture with it on Instagram. We put it on our team Twitter page, all that stuff. And they got to keep it all week in their locker. Uh, and then they had to defend that belt at the next event that we were going to uh, compete for. So that became kind of a thing for preseason conditioning. Well, after that, going into the 2014 season, when we had everybody back, I thought, hey, we're going to be really good. And I was talking to Coach Kirby. I said, I think we should take that championship belt and implement that into everything we do and take it to the next level. With, and just talking about having a championship mentality so that we don't take any game for granted. Because in college basketball, being on the bubble is the difference of one or two wins here and there. It's letting your guard down one night against a team you're better than. And that's sometimes the difference in a team making the, the big dance or not, right? So what we did was we took that championship belt, and I, I brought one here just for, for reference point, for, uh, for the, the YouTube version. So this is, we had this little championship belt, and we would take that before every game, home or away. Uh, we traveled to Hawaii that season, played a couple games in Hawaii. Did, we went on the plane with us that one of our managers would hold it outside the locker room door when the players went out of the locker room after to take the floor for the last time before the game started. Every player touched that championship belt. And on our scouting reports, I had a picture every game that would say round one with a championship belt and it'd have our opponent. And it was just this little subtle reminder that every night is a championship match. Every night is a championship fight. And you have to treat it as such if you actually want to win a championship. So you have to approach every opponent that way. And so it was just that little reminder right at the end, like, hey, we're playing for a title tonight. And ultimately, in that season, we ended up going 29-1 and one and are number two in the nation. And at that point in time, like Harding had spent one week in the top 25 in the history of the program, had never been to the NCAA tournament. So these kids started buying in. Well, all of a sudden, like we're 18 and 0, lose a game in overtime, don't lose again until March Madness. And uh, but I think that was kind of the the run that we went on in the championship. We we won the conference championship. Uh, we came back the next year, and now in our preseason, just talking about culture and talking about vision casting and building upon those things was. We went from pursuing something to now it's like, well, we got to kind of shift our mentality. Now we're defending something. So we had on our preseason workout shirts, we had the championship belt and it said, defend the belt. And it had our belt with the Harding logo on it. And it was all about like, hey, everybody in the conference now, now you're not some unknown. You're not the Cinderella anymore. Now you're the team that everybody wants to beat. So you have to train with that in mind. So, you know, when they're working out and they're looking at each other with defend the belt on their chest, that's something now they had the, a standard they now have to hold to. So that next year, same thing. We got the championship belt. We do the whole deal, win it again, go to the NCAA tournament again. And I think just seeing how the most gratifying part of all of that from a culture building standpoint was that we, we tried something that was out of the box. I mean, and maybe that's the football coach in me, right, to bring a professional wrestling belt into a women's basketball team. And I know that's super outside the box, but I think that was something that even at first, you know, some of the players are probably like, yeah, you know, what are we doing here? But after a while, it started to buy in. And when you see the buy in and you see them getting to the cut down the net and they're holding, they're wearing the championship belt up to go cut down the net and just having this whole embracing of culture, that to me was the, the most gratifying thing, more so even than, you know, personally, just because it's a different level of investment. Being a part of a Rose Bowl championship team and being in Pasadena and all that stuff, that's like, as a boy growing up, those are kind of storybook things that you think about. But from a self, just, gratification seeing something implemented over a five-year journey to culminate with back-to-back -back championships I think that to me was was something that um you know was a lot more gratifying and that was absolutely fantastic those, those uh those are three of the best ones I've heard so far on this thing so great job I, I love the the Wednesday Bible study and the championship bill I mean that 
that's uh, that's nuts and bolts that are going to help a lot of people. Uh, question number four, the million dollar question. What do you know now that you wish you would have known when you first got started? Cool. Um, I think from a coaching perspective, just because of my background, having so many coaches in my family, I feel like I went into coaching pretty much eyes wide open for the most part. Uh, but I, I would say that I, I think uh, as a coach, I would say that just knowing that it's all about relationships in hindsight, you know, it's, you get so much, you get so caught up in the wins and losses and the game planning and the scouting reports and watching film and all those things. And when I look back on some of the best memories I have, it was just riding the bus. It was just the conversations after a loss, even, you know, I can remember like leaving the conference tournament in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, going back to Searcy, Arkansas, and we're driving the bus and I got a player sitting beside me she moved up to the front seat to sit there so we could talk about just kind of debrief on the season. And we talked for three hours all about the next season. You know, it was all about, hey, how can we get better? And so just like just conversations like that where you're, you have shared experiences, you, you battle together, you can sit back and talk about the good times. And so, so many things like that, I think, are what are lost in the mix. And so I think, you know, to me, if you have the ability as a coach to slow down and enjoy just stopping at McDonald's, you know, whenever you take, the, when you park the bus and get in and, and the kids are excited because they're getting to go to McDonald's, whatever those things are, that you just don't take those things for granted because we're all going to win and lose games. We're all going to have the games that we, that we kick ourselves. We'll remember those tough losses more than we do the good wins. It's just how we're wired, I think, as coaches sometimes. But I think when, when you step back, and to me, that the most the reason I say it's about relationships is even years later, when you get a message from a kid, you know, that they, you know, that you meant something to them, or they list you as a reference, and that, that hey, coach, I list you as a reference, would you mind, you know, and then they thank you for all, everything that you've done, you know, all those different things that, to me, that's what I wish that I would have taken some of the pressure off to be everything I was trying to be, and just be a little bit more present in some of those moments, and realize that those would be the things that you ultimately miss, when you kind of pump the brakes, and, and uh, you know, like in my case, kind of get in, transition into coaching your own kids, and, and start off when they're six, seven, eight years old and, and have to have a different level of patience. But when you're coaching those high school kids, college age kids, man, they're just such a, they're such a pivotal age where you have so much opportunity for influence. I think if you miss that part of it and you're only focused on those outcomes that you're going to walk away feeling a little bit empty, you know, from where, where you could have felt if you, if you capitalize on those things. That's fantastic, man. And that's, uh, uh, you know, I'm 53 now, and I still I still remind myself that because it's uh, I, I regret not not putting more into the relationship side when I was when I was younger. So that that was uh, absolutely perfect. Uh, last question. First, uh, first, let's start out with best way to get in touch with you. I know you're on Twitter. Is that is that the best way for people to catch up with you? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I'm at, on Twitter at d underscore walk 74. Uh, that would be the easiest way uh, to say it, say it one more time at D underscore walk 74 is my Twitter handle. Okay. All right. So that, that's uh, the best way to get up with you. And now tell me about your baby, your new baby, the iron horse podcast. Let's hear about it. Yeah. So iron horse podcast, that's something that I'm, I co-host with Brandon Carr and Brandon just finished his 12th season was with the Ravens for the last three years played for the Cowboys for five, the Chiefs for four, a 12-year NFL veteran cornerback going into his 13th season uh, right now. And so Brandon and I met uh, three years ago just off of a potluck. I signed up to coach my kid in the YMCA Basketball League. His son got put on my team, and we met in this very organic way, but we're very like-minded and want to raise our kids the same way through sports uh, with this holistic approach that we talked about on the podcast. So since our kids were three years old, we've been coaching them in football, basketball, even baseball. We have this core group of kids that we just sort of rotate through together through the different sports and have a lot of community within that with parents. And as you can imagine, you know, birthday parties, and all these different things start to have this community that comes with that. And so what we decided to do was put together a podcast that would talk about, you know, you know for, I guess if you had to know where we are first, we're in Dallas, Texas. And as you hear Friday Night Lights, all those everything's Texas football, it's, it's out of control and it starts very young. Uh, and we have every other sport going on here in the Metroplex and every personal trainer you could think of. If you, if you would think about it, it's available to you from a training standpoint. And so many parents spend so much time, 
money and resources into this physical development of these kids starting at ages four, five, six, you name it. So our thought was, what if we took a podcast that would focus on, yeah, everybody's going to do the training if they want their kids to be talented, but what if we did a podcast that specifies all the intangibles that we feel and we know from life experience that these kids need to have, you know, in addition to their ability to be able to sustain that ability and capitalize on what they could ultimately become. And I think where that's, where that podcast is generated from is, if you think about it, any coach listening to this probably has a list of like five kids that come right off the top of their head when I say this, but we all have these players that we either played with or coached that we know right offhand, and man, if that kid would have just had the character, the support system, the intangibles to go with that talent, gosh, there's no telling what they could have been, right? And, and we just, and, and honestly, like, I, I agonize for those kids. Like, I, I, I bemoan the fact that those people didn't reach their potential. And I think, like, what if we could avoid that? Like, what if we just said, hey, from ages five, six, seven, we're going to start pouring into these kids, give them all those things off the field that they need to go with this training that we're pouring into and investing so much time and resource in. So each episode on the Iron Horse podcast, what we do is we take episode topics like uh, body language, mental toughness, uh, talk about raising kids with purpose. We talk about all these different kinds of things, self-discipline, and we've got a lot of topics we're going to start covering in the weeks to come. But what we do is we really just take a topic. Brandon and I, you know, Brandon's played 12 years in the NFL and hasn't missed a start, which is the name Iron Horse Podcast comes from a nickname he got in Kansas City of Iron Horse due to his durability. So he's now 192 consecutive starts as a fifth round draft pick from a Division II university in Grand Valley State. So he didn't have, he wasn't the five-star guy from Michigan or Michigan State. He grew up in Flint with the D2 route, blue collar all the way through. And I think everything about his story is a testament to, to kids. Hey, if you want to work hard, it's out there for you. And so you know, taking his life experience of never missing a start, everything that comes into the discipline needed for that, and sort of juxtapose that with my unique experience of having played in, you know, played at the Division One and Division Two level in football, coached at the Division One and Division Two level in basketball. Uh, you know, both of us played for our dads growing up, so we have this coach's son mentality, all this life experience that we we feel like we can, you know, kind of bounce off each other to talk about these topics, bring on guests to talk about those as well. Uh, we've got we've had former NFL players, college coaches. We've got a WNBA head coach episode coming up uh, with Nikki Collin of the Atlanta Dream, and we just try to diversify that approach. We're going to have coaches from from different sports and current athletes and different things like that to come alongside of us, have those conversations. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be we're not trying to be Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. You know, we're not trying to go talk about who the goat is of whatever sport. You know, the, the hot topic of the day. It's really saying like, hey, how can we be a resource to coaches and parents? They want more for their kids than just for them to be talented championship level players. We want them to be, you know, those things that can support that. And, um, you know, one, one last story on that. And I think it's, as we were preparing for this podcast back in February, we, when Brandon finished the season, we were meeting here in Dallas and we we're talking about some of the things we're looking to do with our kids for spring football, which is a season that hasn't come around just due to the life situation we have with COVID. Um, but we tried talking about the podcast and, the next day after we had this meeting, I'm driving down to the, to the office listening to ESPNU radio. It was Greg McElroy, and they had Tom Luganville on there talking about recruiting. It was around the time of the Under Armour All-American game uh, during that, that week. And Luganville said, um, and I, I almost just stopped in my tracks and I heard him say it because it was exactly what we've just been talking about. He said, you know, we've been doing this for 12 years, have the best athletes in the country come from all over down here to have a week at the Under Armour All-American game. And he said, what happens is, we just sit back and I can just sit back and observe these players during that week, how they treat the support staff. Are they respectful? Are they coachable? How do they respond when they have a bad rep, rep in practice and somebody kind of gets on them? Are they volatile? Are they encouragers? All these different things about how they handle their business just during that week before they even play the game. And he said, by the end of that week, before the game is kicked off, you can pretty much just go around the room and you can start identifying the kids are going to play right away. The kids who are going to make it, and be all conference players and the kids are going to fizzle out because they probably won't be able to help themselves and it's really sad and what and greg McElroy kind of counted that he's like he goes and none of the things you listed have anything to do with their talent he's like no nothing and i thought about that like man how sad is that we're talking about the under armor all-american game which is the best of the best and there's going to be kids that go down there and won't reach their potential because their character can't allow them to and so that's to me is like all that we're trying to do is get a message out there that says 
let's focus on this holistic approach. Let's pour into the kids equally off the field and on the field. And I think that's where the best performances will ultimately come because they'll know that they're more than their performance. They'll play from a place of, of security and stability. And ultimately, I think that's, that to me is going to produce the best citizens that we feel like sports creates so much discipline and still so many teaching things that are life, you know, life skills. Ultimately, as you, when you get to be our age, you recognize those things that, hey, coach was teaching me all this stuff, but it was really more about life than it was about ball. And so if we can just be intentional and, and start shaping those kids' mentalities around that at a young age, then I think we can really maximize the potential to have great leaders born from the sports fields and courts that we put them on. That's awesome, man. I, I think every kid in America needs to hear the Under Armour story because that's, uh, you know, how, how telling is that? That, uh, you know, we, we uh, I, I've heard it said before, and you alluded to this a little before that, uh, you know, everything but attitude. You know, that kid's got all, he's got everything but attitude. His attitude's gonna, gonna, gonna hold him back. Uh, you know, whether it makes him uncoachable or makes him make bad decisions off the field, he's got everything but attitude. And then I wanted to, uh, you know, I've listened to the podcast and, and I, I think it's exactly what you said. Uh, it is for athletes. It is teaching important lessons, but the, the two I listened to, uh, we're not sports specific at all. You know, it could have been a volleyball player or it could have been a football player or a softball player. It, it, it was just good information for, for the parents and for the kids uh, about sports and for sports, but it wasn't a particular sport. So uh, sure. highly well, recommend it. Go that's, ahead. Inten that's intentional. And I think even for the coaches that listen, you know, I know at the high school level, uh, a lot of coaches have to coach multiple sports too. So we want these things to be things that are transferable because uh, a lot of parents in the home, they have kids that they got multiple genders. They got multiple directions. They're going of courts and fields. And so we want these principles to be unilateral. So that, that is by design. We want it to be to hit everybody wherever they are. Well, it, you did it. It was perfect. I, I think the first one I listened to was the body language one and it was just excellent. And we had just gone through with our seniors uh, our leadership meeting uh, two months ago was a body language uh, meeting. Oh, wow. uh, so it, it kind of fit right into what, what we had just told our kids. Uh, David, I, I appreciate you being on here, man. You did a fantastic job. I especially appreciate you easing me in to uh, having a <laughs> basketball coach on the channel. Uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, it, it, you're the dream basketball coach for every, every football guy in the country. And, uh, and, uh, and I thank you for easing me into that. Uh, and I thank you for being on here, man. You, your, your points were right on the money and your podcast is fantastic. And uh, again, I highly recommend everyone uh, subscribe to it. It's uh, a, a, a great thing that's helping kids and, uh, and doing it across all sports. So, uh, so thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate it. This will be on in about four weeks. Okay. Awesome. And um, I, I don't know if we can, I, I didn't, I forgot to throw the handle on there for the podcast, but okay. on Twitter, it is, uh, at the Iron Horse Pod on Twitter and on Instagram, it's at Iron Horse Pod. And so, what we would encourage any dialogue from coaches that are listening for topics like, uh, you know, Coach, you mentioned having just done body language with your guys. You know, if there's topics that you guys are talking about or thinking about that you would like for us to cover or have guests on to talk about, we'd love to hear. We have our list of topics that we think are gonna, we're going to be good, but anything that you guys want to add, we'd love to hear from you guys on those things. So, uh, DM us on that as well. When I put out the notes, I'll put both those Twitters on there so, so that they can reach out to you because I know you're going to get some guys that want to talk to you about it. And, again, awesome. buddy, thanks a lot. You did fantastic. All right. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate you having me. Thank you.